This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and does not substitute for professional medical advice. Please seek a medical professional or healthcare provider if you're seeking any medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Thanks, everyone. So before we dive into today's episode, we want to give a huge shout out to our amazing sponsor, the Larkin Staffing Agency in New York City. Yes. So <laughs> Jules was part of my trauma when yeah. I was just out of, you know, residency, trying to look for a job. I mean, the time it takes to do that is it's insurmountable. So, yeah. And you have to do it during because, you know, once you finish residency, you want to have a plan yeah. to have a job after. Yeah. So you have to do all of this while you are still working and learning and board studying. I was and just all these gonna things. say that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to find a job and that can be just complicated because you don't know like where you're applying. There's so many places to apply to. And they're all different. And yeah. The they're airport. all different. They all have different information, different HRs. requirements. Yeah, exactly. Don't even get me started on HR. And then not only do you have to find a job, but then you need to find your references. You need to schedule your interview, which most of the time, I don't have time to do it unless it's the weekend. Exactly. But anyways, imagine if you were to have a place that could do it all for you. Yeah, that would have been great. Even with Mario, I saw him doing that too. Exactly. It was insane. Yeah. So then on the flip side, it's also hard for employers to hire quality people and find candidates. Yeah. So it's just as hard on both sides. Exactly. Quality people that have the requirements and the things that you need that are reliable, all those things, like just to process like everything, because I can only imagine as an employer, like you put something out there in one of these job recruiting websites and there's a slew of applications that must come into your inbox. Exactly. So it's like, how do you even handle that too? On the Yeah. And how side? do you filter and right. how do you find someone that's going to be right for the job? Because you also can't interview everyone. Exactly. Exactly. But here comes our sponsors to help. Yeah. Larkin Staffing Agency is not just any staffing agency. They're a third generation family owned female led small business run by incredible mother daughter duos. With 87 years of experience under their belt, they have been cornerstones in the healthcare staffing industry, providing top notch candidates for a wide range of positions. Whether you're a teeny tiny private practice or a sprawling multi hospital healthcare system, Larkin Staffing Agency has got you covered. They specialize in staffing nurses, medical assistants, techs, office managers, and so much more. Their candidates are truly the best in the business, ensuring that your healthcare facility runs smoothly and efficiently. So if you're in the New York City area and looking to staff your office, don't wait. Head over to their website at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com or shoot them an email at info at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com for more information. Remember, whatever your staffing needs are, Clearly, you need to start looking with Larkin. Absolutely. And honestly, I have been in contact with them and they are some of the nicest, friendliest people. They're very, very helpful. Just contact. I guarantee you will just be in awe with how nice everyone is there. Like yeah. they really are great people. Yeah. So yeah, we wanted to shout them out because if you're listening to this and you have any any know-how or you've ever even tried to look for a job in the healthcare it's very difficult. world, it's a lot. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a, a lot. lot. It's just a lot of responsibility too. And, oh, yeah. and you might not, you need to look for somewhere where you're going to be happy and that yeah. perfect fit. And they really come in to help do you all out. that legwork for you yeah. and basically make you the most successful candidate. They just help out that whole process out so much because you're already dealing with all the stress of having to look for a job and trying to mitigate all that anxiety of trying to find a job. And they are there to help you out with that, you know, so you can't go wrong. Give them a, give them a look, contact yeah. them again at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com or you can email them at info at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com. Yeah. All right. So back to our episode. Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Hi. We got a two-parter for you today. Yes. I think this is a highly... We've been wanting to do this episode for yeah. a really long time. Yeah. And it's very relevant right now. Yes. You know, 
I mean, yeah, it check out our June recap. We kind yeah. of had a little bit of a subject. Uh, well, today we're talking about birth control. Yeah. <laughs> today and next week. Oh, uh, we're talking about birth control because it is a yeah. monster. It is a lot of information. Yeah. There's a lot of confusion, a lot of yeah. myths, a lot of everything associated with birth control. Yeah. But something super important. Really important. Very topical right now, about. too. So... Let's get into it. But before we do that, we want to thank some new Patreon members. Yes. Thank you, Antonio. Yes. And thank you, Mike. You guys are awesome. Thank you for joining our Patreon group. Yes. And I'm so happy that everyone is jumping on our Patreon. Yes. And for those of you that want to check it out, check it out. Patreon.com forward slash funny medicine podcast. Yes. Where you'll have full episodes there, just like these, but completely full episodes only exclusively available for subscribers yes julie and i sometimes do release some of our patreon episodes so our podcast listeners can see what our patreon episodes are kind of like exactly they're a little bit more punchy yeah (laughs) she's a good word (laughs) because you know we have a little bit of the pay yeah the paywalls between so yeah but yeah so check it out and yeah hopefully you guys enjoy both our patreon and our podcast Mm -hmm. and thank you so much to antonio and mike yes and then you also get the video version of these weekly episodes on the day that the audio comes out versus having a whole week later the video come out so yes so yeah those are some of the perks but anyways let's get into this monster of a freaking topic yeah because that's what it is <laughs> all right so go I'm ahead like, like yeah okay so <laughs> let's go birth control also called the contraception yep refers to methods used to prevent pregnancy there are many different types of birth control available today the main categories include what Hormonal methods. Mm-hmm. These work by using hormones to prevent ovulation or fertilization. Examples include the birth control pills, which is what mostly everyone thinks of. Mm-hmm. The patches. Yes, there's a patch that you can use. Vaginal rings. If you don't know what that is, it is a flexible ring that you insert almost like if it was a tampon. Mm-hmm. And that provides a, a hormonal change. And you can have the injection, so you're injecting the hormone, and then you can also have the implant, which is most commonly known as a Nexplanon. Becky G is a huge person advertising the Nexplanon, but that is also hormonal. There's barrier methods, so literally physically creating a barrier. So these physically block the sperm from reaching the egg. So this includes condoms, diaphragms, and also cervical caps. Three, intrauterine devices, an IUD, which is the one that I'm usually pushing for. (laughs) It's a small, very small T-shaped device. Yeah, it's something very tiny. For those of you that are, you know, watching us, we're we're trying to... I think the word device really freaks people out. I know. So I I feel like I have to use the word device and they're like, what are you putting inside me? Yeah, maybe implant. I mean, I don't even know. The, even the word yeah, implant, yeah. Something, yes, it is something foreign, right? So, right. But, you know, I, I, I really like it when OBs have, like, an actual right. physical example. Yes. Because you look at it and you're like, oh, okay. Absolutely. So, an IUD is a small T-shaped device inserted into the uterus that prevents fertilization um, or implantation. Uh, sterilization is another one. So, that's usually what we say uh, permanent surgical procedures, like a tubal and a vasectomy even though vasectomies are reversible mm-hmm. and then five natural family planning so tracking your cycles avoiding sex during fertile periods so this is called the rhythm method okay yeah, we're gonna go a, a little bit more in depth to oh, all, of, all these, of these but we just want to name them out for you right yeah. now we have emergency contraception as well so the pills that you take so the morning after pill after you have unprotected sex to prevent pregnancy and then you also have spermicidal lubrication. So basically lubrication that has spermicides. So things to kill the sperm. Right. Okay. All right. So birth control, the effectiveness of each one of them is very different. Some methods like IUDs and implants are over 99% effective when used correctly. And for me, it's like when used correctly, it's like an IUD. It's like we're not. Yeah. The weight's inserted. Exactly. Right? The weight's positioned as well. Right. So, I don't know. A good example that I have for this is my mom. She actually had an IUD and she lost a ton of weight and then she got pregnant with my brother. My God. It shifted. No way. It shifted. Yeah. 
Oh my god. Well, mine almost fell out. I was gonna me. say, I'm, I'm like, I don't know if you want to like bring no, it up. No, no, like, yeah, yeah. Jules, hers like fell out. Or, it didn't. And, like, thankfully, it, it didn't fully did. come out. But like, but yeah, you had a scare. One hundred percent. Yeah. Thankfully, like you know, not thankfully, but like I mean, thankfully, it did find out in time. You weren't ready you to work at that moment. Exactly. And thankfully, you did not have an unexpected surprise. Exactly. I mean, I went to the to the OB guy, and he was like, "Uh, when was your last period?" I'm like. Oh my god! What? What? <laughs> it's like honestly, I'm very surprised that it's still here. Wow, that's Jesus! Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. and then others like condoms are around an 85 percent effective um, with typical use. Okay, so most birth control methods are reversible, meaning fertility returns when you stop using them. The exceptions are sterilization procedures, which are permanent. And let me just say this: there are people that have tubal ligations and still get pregnant. Yeah, okay. it wasn't so like it just depends on what the surgeon did exactly exactly um, it's important to know that while the birth control pre- while birth control prevents pregnancy the methods do not protect against sexually transmitted infections and this is like my red my red sign when i talk to this up to my teens i could only imagine kids that are sexually active yeah it's you still need to protect yourself against stds yeah okay so only barrier methods like condoms provide protection against both pregnancy and STI. So usually when I recommend a birth control, I say you still need to use condoms. It okay. is. So choosing a birth control method is a personal decision that depends on factors like your health, lifestyle, future pregnancy plans, and your doctor can help you kind of come up with that decision. Mm-hmm. And there's other things that we use birth control for as well. Yeah. But we're going to focus on contraception. Yeah. So... <clears throat> let's take a look at the most common options a little bit more. Hormonal options. So BC pills, as I used to call them back then when I used to take them, or birth control pills. So they're known as the oral contraceptives. They are a very popular and effective method of pre- preventing pregnancy. And they work by using hormones to alter the body's natural reproductive process. So how do they do this? So they, one, prevent ovulation. So the main way these birth control pills work is by stopping ovulation, which is a release of an egg from the ovaries. They do so by providing synthetic versions of two hormones naturally produced in a woman's body. And these are estrogen and progestin. These hormones trick the brain into thinking that the body's already pregnant, so it doesn't trigger the release of an egg. And then second, Thickening of the cervical mucus. Birth control pills often thicken the mucus around the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus. And this thicker mucus makes it harder for the sperm to travel through the cervix and reach an egg, even if one were to be released. And then three, thinning of the uterine lining. The hormones in the pill can also thin the lining of the uterus, which then makes it less likely for a fertilized egg to attach and develop. Though this is not considered a primary mechanism of action. Fourth, consistent use is key. For both birth control pills to be most effective, they need to be taken every day, ideally at the same time. When used correctly, they're about 99% effective at preventing pregnancy. Five, so there are two types, which we're going to mention here now, and these are combination pills that contain both estrogen and progestin. And the other type is progestin-only pills, also called as mini pills. So the combination pills are more common and work primarily by preventing ovulation, while progestin-only pills rely more on thickening cervical mucus and thinning the uterine lining. And six is that this is a reversible method. It's important to note that the effects of birth control pills are reversible. Once a woman stops taking the pill, her natural fertility typically returns within a few months. Sometimes it doesn't even need to be a few months. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So with these hormonal ones, we also talked about the patches. Mm-hmm. So the birth control patches are small. They're thin adhesive squares that you stick on your skin. So it's kind of like a bandage. They slowly release hormones into your body through your skin. These hormones are similar to the ones that your body naturally produces. The main way the patch prevents pregnancy is by stopping ovulation. The hormones in this patch trick your brain into thinking that you're already pregnant so that it doesn't trigger a release of an egg. Without the egg, there's no fur, there's no, there's nothing for the sperm to fertilize. So pregnancy can't occur. So that's mainly how it works. The patch also has two other ways of preventing pregnancy. Again, it's going to thicken that cervical mucus like we already talked about in the cervix. And then it also thins the lining of your uterus. So if you wear a new patch every week for three weeks, then go patch-free one week. That's usually how you use the patch. 
during the week that you usually have, during the week that you don't have a patch is usually when you have a menstrual cycle. So even during this week without a patch, you're still protected from pregnancy, right? And it's hard and we're not going to go deep into it because yeah. it's a lot of physiology and actually this physiology is, uh, is just hard in itself to understand. Exactly. But there's fluctuations of hormones going up and down and then the going up and down and estrogen and progesterone and all of these can trigger what's, you know, the release of the egg and everything. So when you're using these hormones, you're kind of interfering with that fluctuation of hormones. Mm -hmm. So that's when, what we mean when we say it's tricking your brain, right? We're, right? we're interfering with that fluctuation of hormones. So the patch is designed to keep steady levels of the hormones in your body throughout the week, right? So this is different from birth control pills where the hormone levels can go up and down each day. The steady hormone levels from the patch can reduce some side effects that some people experience with the pills. So it's important to change your patch on the same day each week for it to work effectively. When, when you use it correctly, it's over 99% effective at preventing pregnancy. However, in real world use, it's about 91% effective, mainly because people sometimes forget to change your patch on time. Yeah. So remember, while the patch is very good at preventing pregnancy, it's not, it doesn't protect against CIs. Okay. So I feel like that's going to be a disclaimer that we're going to say in every single one. Yeah, 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 yeah that false confidence i guess yeah, of you course. know of like i feel like everyone has false confidence yeah yeah like every time. single time that someone like a parent told me oh i was breastfeeding i didn't know that i could have pregnant yeah like, yeah i mean i don't yeah. know like in what world like do you live under a rock i feel like everyone knows that right i know but anyways we also have the vaginal rings so the birth control vaginal rings are small flexible plastic rings that you insert into your vagina to prevent pregnancy they work by slowly releasing these hormones into your body through the vaginal wall the main way the vaginal ring prevents pregnancy is by stopping the ovulation as well thickening that cervical mucus and also thinning the line of the uterus you typically wear the ring for about three weeks at a time. After three weeks, you remove it for one week. And then that's, again, when you would have your menstrual cycle. So even during this week without the ring, you're still protected against, protected against pregnancy. The ring is designed to keep your steady levels of hormones in your body throughout the month. This is different from birth control pills. Okay, same way we kind of talked about the patch, where the hormone levels go up and down each day. The ring is going to give you a steady level of hormones, uh, just like the patch, okay? And it can also help reduce the side effects that some people experience with the pills. When it's used correctly, the ring is also more than 99% effective. But again, in the real world, it's usually 91 to 93% effective, mainly because people sometimes forget to change out the ring. So it's important to note that the ring is very good at preventing pregnancy, but again, not at STIs. So use condoms. Yep. Next up is injections. So birth control injections are also known as contraceptive shots. The most common type is Depo-Provera. Yeah, Depo-Shots. There you go. Yeah, I, remember, I know them as Depo-Shots, but that's the whole name anyway. But there are other brands available as well. How they kind of work, the injection contains a hormone called progestin. This is similar to the natural hormone that you have, which is progesterone that your body naturally produces. The main way it prevents pregnancy is, again, by stopping ovulation. And then, again the thinning of the uterus and the thickening of the mucus around the cervix. So you typically get an injection once every three months. So that's about 13 weeks from a healthcare provider. It's usually injected into your arm or your buttocks. And then when used correctly, birth control injections are very effective, more than 99% effective at preventing pregnancy when you get the shots on schedule. Then while the injection is very good at preventing pregnancy, again, louder for the people in the back does not protect against STIs. You need a condom for that. After you stop getting the injections, it can take several months for your fertility to return to normal. This means it might take a little longer to get pregnant after stopping the shots compared to other forms of birth control. And like all medications, birth control injections can have some side effects. These can include changes in your menstrual bleeding, weight gain, headaches, and mood changes. It's important to discuss these potential side effects with your healthcare provider. And then you have implants. So birth control implants are small, flexible plastic rods about the size of a matchstick that are inserted under the skin of a woman's upper arm to prevent pregnancy. So in the U.S., the brand name for this is, like she had said, Nexplanon. The implant works by slowly releasing a hormone called progestin in the body. And again, this hormone does exactly the same as before, the thickening of the mucus, the thinning of the lining, and it also stops ovulation. So once inserted by a healthcare professional, the implant can prevent pregnancy for up to three to five years, depending on the type. 
It's considered one of the most effective forms of birth control available. Less than one in 100 women using the implant will get pregnant in a year. Some key points about these birth control implants, they are long lasting, but they're reversible. You can have the implant removed at any time if you want to try to get pregnant. They're also very convenient. So once it's in place, you don't have to remember to take a pill every day or use something every time you have sex. They don't contain estrogen, so they can be used by women who can't take estrogen-based birth control. They can cause changes in your menstrual bleeding pattern. Some women have lighter periods or no periods at all, while others may have irregular bleeding. Like all hormonal birth control methods, they can have side effects. These may include headaches, breast tenderness, or mood changes. And again, they don't protect against sexually transmitted infections. Condoms will be needed for that. Yeah. And also, I feel like with the next one on, the most common complaint is the abnormal periods. Yeah. So you get a, a little bit of bleeding, and then it stops, and then it comes back a couple days later, and then it mm-hmm. stops. And people are like, oh, I'm just so tired of this. It's been months. It takes six months at least. Mm-hmm. For it to, and you might not even have abnormal bleeding. Yeah, you know? it just happens to some but people. It just yeah. happens to some people, and it can last. But remember, you are playing around, not playing, but you are interfering with that hormone, yeah. right? With those hormone levels. So it's going to take time for your body to adjust. And some yeah. bodies adjust differently than others. And sometimes if it's too annoying, like it's too much, or maybe too mm-hmm. heavy of a bleed or something like that, we can also kind of treat that with birth control pills Mm -hmm. and some people you know freak out they're like wow the whole entire point of the next one was for birth control so why are you putting me on a pill and it's only temporary right but if it's so annoying yeah okay yeah yeah and you're gonna get protection for three to five years okay well let's try taking these pills as well to control the bleeding until you're finally on a regular cycle yeah it's definitely one person's experience is not you know it's very different for practically everyone you know it all depends on your own body chemistry how your body is and all that so it could be very different amongst people like don't listen to one friend there's many your body could be completely different and to me it comes down to how serious are you about protection yeah yeah are you really serious about it is that what you really want yeah right so if you really want something okay you're going to have a time and adjustment period yeah. right but you're gonna get there right so if that's important to you that you should be able to kind of push through the annoyances of an irregular cycle yeah and then also you gotta talk to your doctor because maybe yeah. that's not the best suited birth, birth control, control for you you, you know there's oh, other options yeah, there are you know other, so that's options. why you gotta talk to them and this maybe you're on explanon or the double shot or whatever because that's the one that your provider was like you know what given your history or however your period is or whatever the case this is what i recommend to you so yeah. it's very important you can't it, it's not like oh yeah i'm just gonna take this it there's more to that yeah. now we're going to talk about the barrier methods so mm-hmm. the first one we're going to talk about is what everyone is usually aware of or what they teach about mostly is condoms yep. so condoms are a thin protective sheath that's used during sexual activities to prevent pregnancy and reduce the risk of sexually transmitted diseases they act as a physical barrier that stops the bodily fluids from being exchanged between partners during sex There's two main types of condoms. There's an external condom, which is the one that people are mostly aware of. These are the most common type. They're worn on over the male penis. Male penis. Of course, it's a male penis. Wow. Okay. (laughs) They're worn over the penis and are typically made of latex. There are some non-latex options out there and are available for those with these allergies. There's also an internal condom, which is the female one. These are inserted into the vagina or anus before sex, and they're usually made of polyurethane or nitrile. Both types of condoms work by creating a barrier that prevents sperm from reaching the egg, thus preventing pregnancy. They also block the transmission of many STIs by preventing direct contact between partners' genitals and bodily fluids. So there's a variety of condoms. This includes latex condoms, which is the most common type. So it's basically made out of a natural rubber contain and it's made from the sap of rubber trees i did not even know that you didn't know that? rubber trees no. yeah florida has a bunch of them Interesting. it's it's the, the the really really big ones with the huge roots oh, okay that spread out like that yeah, I don't think it. yeah rubber tree that's where we get the, the rubber more, yes so <laughs> it's most widely used for the material of condoms due to its elasticity strength and effectiveness we also use latex for clubs as well so many things um, yeah for so many things and it basically it prevents pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases 
So latex condoms are affordable and widely available. However, some people may have a latex allergy and in which case they use the one that are latex free and it's an alternative material. So non-latex condoms are made from materials like polyurethane or polyspring, poly polyisoprene, sorry. For those with latex allergies, polyurethane is a type of plastic material used to make condoms. It's thinner and less elastic than a latex, than latex providing some different sensation during use. Polyurethane condoms are also suitable for people with latex allergies. They are more expensive than latex condoms and may be more likely to slip or break because it doesn't have the elasticity that latex does. And then polyisoprene is synthetic version of natural rubber latex. It also has similar properties to latex, such as softness, elasticity, but without the proteins that cause the latex allergies. So polyisoprene condoms are more expensive than latex condoms. Mm -hmm. Of course. Why, right? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. it just has to be. Just make it more difficult for people to have protection. And then the other one that's also a more natural version of a condom is going to leave lambskin. So it's a natural membrane. So lambskin condoms, also known as natural membrane condo condoms, are made from intestinal lining of lambs. Yummy. Yeah. yeah. Great. Oh, so really gets so you in the mode. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, gross. That's just what I'm throwing I know. It's like, who thought of that? I know. Can you imagine the person that thought of that first? Like, But this is what they used to use back in the day. Oh, for sure. Yeah. They used a bunch of crazy stuff yeah. back in the day. But yeah. like, this one stuck. Yeah. Ugh. They are thinner and provide more sensation than a latex condom. However, lambskin condoms contain tiny pores that may allow some of the sexually transmitted diseases to pass through, making them less effective at preventing STIs compared to other materials. They are also more expensive than latex condoms. You can also have, so another version of a regular condom is a lubricated condom. So these come pre-lubricated for easier use and also reduces the risk of breakage. There are textured... I don't this one. Because they're tight. It's just, it's just I, I mean, know. they're lubricated. There are textured condoms for sensation. There are flavored condoms. Okay. <laughs> and then there are also short, thin condoms. Okay. Yeah. There are many types of condoms. You can, you have a plethora to pick from. <laughs> exactly. So there's no excuse to not. Exactly. There's no excuse to not have a condom on you. When used correctly, condoms are highly effective. For external condoms, about 98% of women whose partners use them consistently and correctly will not get pregnant in a year. For internal condoms, it's about 95%. However, with typical use, which includes occasional errors, the effectiveness is lower in around 85 to, for external condoms and 79 for internal condoms. So yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. Okay, there are more things that are more effective and also easier to use, and you don't have to use the lamb intestine. <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so gross. It is gross. I mean, I, I have you ever even seen? I don't think I've seen one. I don't, I don't want it. No, I've seen, I've seen a lamb skin. You have? I had to like. Well, yeah, I mean, it's your, yeah. You yeah. Do you still give away free condoms? Oh, yeah, yeah. clinic. Well, not in my clinic, mm -hmm. but where I used to work, we yeah. used to have, like, a whole thing. We would just, like, take them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. What, but what do lambskin condoms even look like? Um, so, they look, I mean, I imagine, like, a different color. They have to have a different yeah, color. Yeah, yeah, and you see it. It looks like a different texture and everything, but they use it, though. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So it's important to note that while condoms significantly reduce the risk of many STIs, it's not 100%. Okay, so yes, we do recommend to wear them to protect you against sexually transmitted diseases, but it's not 100%. Yeah. So condoms are most effective at the STIs that spread through bodily fluids like HIV, chlamydia, or gonorrhea. And obviously, this is all through sexual intercourse, okay? Mm -hmm. This can be, mm -hmm. this can also be given in other ways. Yeah. But they provide less protection against STIs that spread through skin to skin contact, like herpes, HPV, and those still have it, it's still reduced risk, but the risk is there. Yeah. So to work effectively, condoms must be used correctly every single time that you, that you have sex. Yeah. This means putting them on before any genital contact occurs and using a new condom for each act of intercourse. It's also important to check the expiration date and make sure the packaging isn't damaged before use. Don't use the one that you've had in your car f for the last 10 years yeah. or in your wallet and it's yeah, all and like... It's like disintegrate the moment that it goes. Inside. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah. Remember, condoms are the only form of contraception that also protects against STIs, making them a crucial tool for sexual health. And... um jumping out of that it's diaphragms <laughs> so diaphragms are a type of birth control device used by women to prevent pregnancy they are shallow dome shaped cups made of silicone or latex that are inserted into the vagina before sex to cover the cervix and block sperm from entering the uterus 
literally looks like a condo. Um, for those yeah. that are listening, I'll put I'm I'll put a photo a here of what the diaphragm looks like. Yeah, it's just it's a just larger like, version. Of a yeah, it's so weird. Yeah, but it, it's very similar. Yeah, I just wrote these notes, but I didn't look at them photos or i mean if i did maybe now that i'm looking at that i did order anyway yeah th- anyway so like i said shallow dome-shaped cups made of silicone or latex and they're inserted into the vagina before sex to cover the cervix and block sperm from entering the uterus i'll put a photo right here <laughs> so there's a few different types of diaphragms there's an arching spring diaphragm and these have firm curved rim that makes them easier to insert these are good for women with weaker Vaginal, I was about to say vaginal, muscle <laughs> toe. Next is coil spring diaphragms that have a softer, more flexible rim. They work well for r- women with average vaginal um, muscle tone. Then you have flat spring diaphragms. These are very thin, flexible rims, and they're best for women with strong vaginal muscles. And then there's a newer one-size-fits-most diaphragm called Kaya or Kaya, and they don't require a fitting by a doctor. So to use a diaphragm, a woman first applies spermicide to the inside of the cup and around the rim. She then folds the diaphragm in half, inserts into in deep into the vagina, positioning it to cover her cervix. The diaphragm forms a physical barrier to block sperm, while the spermicide helps immobilize or kill any sperm that gets around the edges. For maximum effectiveness, the diaphragm should be left in place for at least six hours after sex, but no more than 24 hours total. When used perfectly keyword perfectly diaphragms are about 94 percent effective at preventing pregnancy however with typical use they're about 88 percent effective still too difficult yeah that's like, well that sounds like a lot of work not enough success a lot of work the the in the out the hours the, the remember to take uh, the sperm aside uh, put it around uh, the rent uh, put it on the stone put it on everything have it fitted and too much, too much. yeah in our we opinion. have better options yeah so some advantages of the diaphragms because you're like like us like it's just a lot of work they don't contain hormone they can be inserted hours before sex and are reusable i still have a better thing that does not contain hormones and is not as difficult and no, we'll talk about it and you don't have to reuse it like yeah. that i don't I'm not into that. However, they require proper fitting and insertion to work well and don't protect against sexually transmitted infections. While not as popular as some other birth control methods today, diaphragms remain an option for women looking for a non-hormonal barrier method of contraception that they control. Yeah. So then you have cervical caps. So these are small reusable silicone or rubber cups that are used as a form of birth control. They work by covering the cervix, which is the opening to the uterus. It's that long pointy part at the end of the uterus. It prevents the sperm from entering and then fertilizing the egg. So there are a few different types of cervical caps. There's a fem cap, which I think is the most commonly known one. The only available cervical cap available in the U.S. Most likely the reason why I only know fem cap. And it's made from silicone and comes in three sizes. Then you have two, which is Leah's shield. This was another type of cervical cap that was previously available, but has been discontinued since 2008. Then you have preventive cap. This was an ultra type of cervical cap that's no longer used in the U.S. So to use a cervical cap, a woman has to insert it into her vagina before sexual intercourse, making sure it covers her cervix. Um, then for added effectiveness, spermicide is usually used around the cap. It's very similar to a yeah. diaphragm. Okay. So then after sex, this cap needs to stay in place, and just like the diaphragm, and then no longer than 48 hours. So you can probably still leave it on for a little longer, but why would you? I don't understand. It's so complicated. I feel like yeah. this is so complicated, and this is the reason why some people don't end up using these type of protections because it's a hassle. It is. It sounds like a hassle. And then it's important to note that cervical caps are less effective than some other forms of birth control for women who have never given birth. They have a failure rate of about 14%. And then for women who have given birth, the failure rate is higher at around 29%. So Mm. cervical caps do not protect against sexually transmitted infections. So they are often recommended to be used in combination with condoms for those who need an STI protection. I mean, just the condom itself has more yeah. of, of a percentage of a higher success rate, yeah. like preventing that. So what? Like what? Why? I don't know. But yeah, to each um, own. Yeah. So while cervical caps can be an option for women who prefer non-hormonal birth control methods, they do require a prescription and proper fitting by a healthcare provider to ensure that they work correctly. So much work. I have never had training for cervical caps. Okay. I was going to ask you that, like in residency or anything like that. Well, I mean, you don't have to, you're not OB, so 
to but no but no, but I, you I, can... I can do a next one all right, and then right. I had my attendings teach me to do IUDs yeah. birth control the injection the ring like literally so yeah. many other forms that I have never had anyone train me on a cervical cap and maybe once on the diaphragm just so I knew how to use it right 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 I see that but like I don't I don't know man and and one thing it's very much my opinion like for me personally I know that's a lot of people don't care because then you have like the diva cups and whatever yeah. that's different so but anything that's reusable in that area for me is an immediate no yeah I mean it's an immediate no yeah so I have to you and I'm like how clean are you that's just see it's an ick it's such a like why let's yeah. just do the condom and get rid of it and that's it yeah, like you know I... you'll never see it again and it's gone it's, ugh. god oh, no shame. pretty much like <laughs> off out with it like you didn't want it there in the beginning hence the the barriers i don't in my opinion there's a lot of people like for instance people that use like diva cups and stuff like that you don't care about reusing it whatever that's yeah. you know again preferences right yeah. I think everyone has their preference. Exactly. And but have, this is a lot of work. Yeah, exactly. Now, I have my own preference. As, yeah. Like, personally uh, and also professionally, yeah. recommend, like, recommending. Right. Okay, is the IUDs. Yeah, I, same. Like, I same. always say that this is the way to go. Yeah, um, I agree. Um devices are IUDs, which, which are the small T-shaped devices that we place inside a woman's uterus to prevent pregnancy. So they're a mm -hmm. form of long-acting reversible contraception that can be effective for three to 10 years, depending on the type of IUD that you use. So there's two main types of IUDs. There's the copper. Okay, so this was the option that I was saying, I have a better option that's less hassle and no, horm no hormones. Yep. So the copper IUD, this is um, wrapped in a small amount of copper wire, which only the copper IUD is available in the U.S. is called the Paragard. And then you have the hormonal IUDs. So this T-shaped device is going to slowly kind of release small amounts of hormones like progestin. And there's four different brands that we use. The most common one was the Mirena. Now I hear a lot of Kylina, Liletta, and also Skyla. Okay. I love how they're all I know. names. I feel like it's like a whole entire like super su superhero. Yeah. Yeah. They do sound like Charlie's Angels. Like yeah, there's exactly. something. Like Charlie's Angels. Like Marina, Kailina, Liletta, and Skyla. Like Skyla. Right, yeah. Liletta. What's your name? Yeah, exactly. Kailina. I mean, but talk about like an attractive name. Yeah. Like, can you imagine? Marina. Yeah, I know. They all sound like so like, you know, sensual. <laughs> Skyla. <laughs> Skyla. Oh, God, Julie. I'm over here thinking superheroes that she's like Vixen. Well, yeah, look at this, Skyla. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> IUDs work to prevent pregnancy in a few different ways. So the copper IUD releases copper ions, which are toxic to sperm, okay? And then it prevents the sperm from reaching and fertilizing an egg. Okay? That's so cool how that works. Like, Also, copper IUDs, am I wrong? Doesn't it change the, like, the pH? Maybe. Double check. But I know that for sure it's like that that much i know for sure like the ions and whatever and it's toxic for the sperm i mean it's like the copper ions that affect the sperm. i thought the copper ions affect the the actual environment i see what you mean the sperm less but i guess it's all the same mm -hmm. think about it probably okay funny well, yeah because it's all it's in the environment the ions exactly, are in, yeah exactly so, okay. Uh, all right. So that was copper IUD. And then hormonal IUDs thicken the cervical mucus, which blocks and traps the sperm. They also thin the uterine lining and then may sometimes prevent ovulations. Just like the pill. Like what, exactly. uh, when we started this. Exactly. So both types of IUDs can change the environment inside the uterus, making it really difficult for the sperm to move and to even survive. Mm -hmm. And then IUDs are over 99% effective at preventing pregnancy. They don't require daily action from the user, which is why they're sometimes called set it and forget it birth control mm -hmm. and then they do not protect against sexually transmitted diseases and a healthcare provider can insert the IUD during the simple in-office procedure and it can be removed in the same in-office procedure as well yeah okay and I feel like there's oh my god everyone has this whole entire nightmare oh about I know what you an mean. IUD insertion Social really media scares people. Social media has really, really gone gone whole on this. I don't yeah, know why. I don't even exactly. know where it stems from. Don't get me wrong; it's uncomfortable. It yeah. feels like a like a strong cramp. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. and and yes, the pain is subject subject. Yes, subjective. Yeah. Uh, I always say <laughs> subject and objective. But pain is subjective. So what's yeah. painful for me not might might not be painful right. for you, and right. vice versa. But when I got my ID, I was shitting bricks. 
Yeah. That's yeah. Shitting I, rem- I remember. And, and I had told you, I'm like, I've had it done twice already. Yeah. It's going to hurt a bit, but you're going to be okay. Yeah. And then yeah. I, I, it's really not what was, social media has like made it seem. I was bracing for it. And she's like, we're all done. And then yeah. I'm like, excuse me? Yeah. 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 That's it. I'm telling you. What really, like, what sucks is a removal. Because when I had mine removed, yeah. well, now, you know, that that sucked. But honestly, it was like a second. Yeah. And it's, but what I see on social media, it's like people like, oh my God, yeah. I'm still in the car. I'm back in the car now and I'm dying. I'm like, no, I, I went I've... straight back to work. Exactly. I went straight back to work. I literally went into my same clinic to my talk. Yeah, I mean, I it was, it, it was, it was nothing. It was like, okay. Yes, you exactly. Know? Yeah, I felt a little bit uncomfortable and okay, but. Dude, I, I, I had worse periods. I literally was about to say that. Yeah. Like periods are way worse. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, and I don't even have any discomfort because of it. Same. So, and Adam. also, I just want to mention too, there are a lot of providers that say that you cannot get an IUD if you haven't given birth before. Yeah, that is false. That's a lie. That is false. Yeah, you can get an IUD. Get a different provider. Is, yeah, I think the insertion is going to be not as easy, right? Because when you give birth it changes your anatomy so it might be a little bit easier to get the IUD in but that doesn't mean that it's impossible so I've had yeah. many people say oh well no my doctor told me that I had to be I had to give birth that's, that's actually not true that's a little messed up yeah you know for the provider to think lie about I that I think it's more it's more difficult and I think a lot of people have mm. they just don't feel comfortable yeah. right yeah so maybe they have more experience with putting in an IUD on someone that's already had that's already childbearing but you don't need to have a child to get an IUD. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm glad that you said that because yeah. it's, yeah, that's messed up. Yeah. So the other form, sterilization. This is a permanent form of birth control that surgically prevents a person from being able to reproduce. There are two types of sterilizations, one for people with female reproductive organs and one for people with male reproductive organs. For people with female reproductive organs, the most common type of sterilization is called tubal ligation, sometimes referred to as getting your tubes side. In this procedure, the fallopian tubes, which carry eggs from the ovaries to the uterus, are surgically closed off. This prevents sperm from reaching an egg and fertilizing it. And there are several ways for tubal ligation, how it could be done. So the tubes can be cut and tied or sealed shut. Next, you could also have them clipped with clips or bands. These could be put in the tubes to block them, block that passage, or sections of the tubes can just be removed entirely. Another option for female sterilization is bilateral sapping. There you go. I just know the, the, there's a Cuban word that's a very bad word. And if it's something, and it's like very similar sounding to this. So that's the only time that I had heard that. Anyway, (laughs) where both fallopian tubes are completely removed. With people with male reproductive organs, the sterilization procedure is called a vasectomy. In this outpatient surgery, the tubes that carry sperm, called the vas deferens, are cut and sealed. This prevents sperm from mixing with semen and leaving the body. Both types of sterilizations are considered permanent and are over 99% effective at preventing pregnancy. They work by creating a physical barrier that stops eggs and sperm from meeting and then creating a baby. However, the procedures don't affect hormone levels or change anything else about a person's body or sexual function. It's important to note that while highly effective sterilization procedures are intended to be permanent, people considering sterilization should be sure that they don't want children or additional children in the future. Sterilization also doesn't protect against STIs, so other precautions are still needed. And then I know everybody's thinking about vasectomies, and we've all heard that they're, you know, are they reversible or are they not? So yes, they are. Vasectomies can often be reversed, but there are some important factors to consider. Vasectomies reversals are possible um, through surgical procedures called vasectomies. No. Go ahead. Vasectomy. There you go. Or? Oh, sorry. No, 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 I mean. The other one. Vasoepididymostomy. Those things. It's the epididymis. So, vasoepididymostomy. Jesus. Lord. Yeah. No, no. I think epididymis is also something that's hard to say. So, epididymis. Yeah, epididymis. Yeah. So, vasoepididymostomy. That's like. Okay. These surgeries um, reconnect the vas deferens tubes that were cut during the original vasectomy. Now, the success rates uh, for vasectomies reversal range from 60 to 95%. However, success depends on several factors, 
including time since the original vasectomy was performed. So success rates tend to decline over time. The skill and experience of the surgeon, the type of reversal procedure needed, and the age and fertility of both partners involved. So the reversal surgery is more complex than the original vasectomy. It typically takes two to four hours and is usually performed under general anesthesia. And the recovery for this is longer than for a normal vasectomy with lifting and pushing restrictions for six to eight weeks. Most men can return to work within five to 14 days, depending on their job. And well, the costs, vasectomy re reversals are often expensive, ranging from $5,000 to $15,000 and are usually not covered by insurance. Alternatives, if reversal is impossible or successful, other options like sperm extraction and in vitro fertilization may be considered. And some considerations for this, if you're considering a vasectomy but think that you may want children in the future, it's generally recommended to explore other contraceptives as your first option. It's important to note that while reversal is often possible, vasectomy should be considered a permanent form of contraception, like I've said, um, and the decision of the reverse should be made carefully, considering all your factors, including success rates, costs, and alternatives. So, yeah. So, are any forms of female sterilization reversible? Some forms of female sterilization can potentially be reversed, but reversibility is not guaranteed and depends on several factors. So reversibility potential varies by sterilization method. So tubal ligation methods, tubal ligation methods that remove less of the fallopian tube have a higher potential for reversal compared to more destructive methods. So clip and band methods have shown higher reversal success rates, so 84% and 72% respectively, compared to other techniques. Microsurgical techniques have improved reversal success rates over time. So using microsurgery, some studies have reported pregnancy success rates of 50 to 70% after reversal attempts. However, even with microsurgery, reversal of some methods have lower success rates. Reversal is considered a major surgery, so it's more complex than an original sterilization procedure. It's expensive. It's often not covered by insurance. And then the risk of reversals include 15 to 20% chance of an ectopic pregnancy. So the reason why is in the fallopian tube, it has like these little hairs that push along the egg, right? So if you mess around with the fallopian tube during a tubal ligation or a clipping or something, then you're messing around with those little hairs, right? Yeah. Those little, little hairs that are going to push the egg, right? So if you're not able to push the egg, then the egg can potentially be fertilized where it is in the fallopian tube. And that's what we call an ectopic pregnancy. And that's really dangerous. Yes. And that could be, that's very dangerous. You can have 15 to 20% chance of an ectopic pregnancy after reversal and then 15% chance of a miscarriage as well. Right. So not as a, it just wasn't a successful pull of pregnancy. So time since sterilization affects success. The longer the time since sterilization, the lower the chances of successful reversal. Alternatives exist if reversal fails. In vitro fertilization may be an option for some women. Now, sterilization should be considered permanent. Despite some reversal potential, sterilization is intended to be permanent and irreversible. So women considering sterilization should be counseled on its permanence and the availability of highly effective reversible contraceptive methods. And also, it, I have heard of cases where even the ser like the tubal ligation is not even successful. Exactly. Yeah. And it all depends on the surgeon, how it's performed, you know, all those things. But yeah, that's yeah. definitely happened. And complications. It's it's like uh, these, these are surgeries, you know, so be sure that that's what you want to do. But so uh, that's the end of part one. Yeah. So in part one, <laughs> we mostly focused on like the hormonal, the very, yeah. the IUD, more common ones you guys have heard. Ones. And then in our next episode, we'll be talking about the other ones. Like yeah. Family planning and all myths. myths associated with birth control. Things like that. Yeah. So stay tuned for that. They'll be coming out next week from whenever you're hearing this. And yeah, uh, check us out on patreon.com forward slash yes. funny medicine podcast. <laughs> Thank yes. you, Patreons. You guys are the best. Check us out on all forms of social media. We're pretty much everywhere. If you have a topic that you would like for us to cover or something that you saw in the news, whatever it is, let us know in any, either here, wherever it is that you're listening or watching, or in any form of social media, like I said, or at our email, funnymedicine305 at gmail.com. Okay. We'll see you in the next one. See you in the next one. Bye. Bye. Like, comment, review us on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, etc. 
Check us out on Instagram and TikTok at Funny Medicine Podcast. Our Gmail is at funnymedicine305 at gmail.com. And remember, we are not diagnosing you. Definitely not. Just funny stuff. See you later, guys. <laughs>